If you were trapped in an abandoned police station while being hunted down by the followers of a demonic cult, what would you do? It's been one year since their leader was lost, and now these maniacs are back for revenge. I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the insane cult in Malum. <laughs> It's this rookie cop's first shift, and everything is going to hell. These girls were enjoying a nice, relaxing day at the river until someone took them to a pig farm in the middle of the woods, where they were met by a group of strange women in old-fashioned clothes. It looked like they could tell something wasn't right, but they had no idea just how horrifying things were about to get. That night, they were taken out to the barn, tied up with sacks over their heads, and forced to kneel in front of some makeshift demonic throne. The cultists sang and danced with joy as their leader pulled one of the girls to the center of the room, slicing her forehead with a ritualistic blade before brutally killing her and feeding the body to his pigs. Police raided the farm, saving the remaining three girls, but back at the station, the officers noticed that the captain was acting strange. These two officers were were working on their target practice when out of nowhere the woman's head exploded into a bloody pulp. The captain had snapped, massacring everyone at the station with his shotgun. One year later, his adult daughter Jessica decides to follow in her father's footsteps and become a police officer herself, determined to clear her family's name and find out the truth about what happened. Before going to the station, she stops to visit her father's grave, never noticing a demonic symbol painted in blood on the other side of the tombstone. Night falls, and she notices some creepy people watching her as she drives through the town. While she's distracted, she nearly runs over this one-eyed lady and her friend. They taunt her and throw something bloody onto the windshield, and when she gets out to investigate, she finds that it's the head of a baby pig. Sometime later, she arrives at her post for the night, the old police station where her father slaughtered his teammates just the year before. This place is abandoned, with the department deciding to relocate to a newer building across town after the incident. The thing is, someone still needs to man the desk until the move is officially complete, and Jessica here has volunteered for the job. But that was her biggest mistake. Coming soon to a theater near you, how to beat official Patreon. All the guts, all the blood, all the screams, plus nasty extras. How to beat Patreon. Two times the shock, two times the terror, two times the subscription levels. Have a damn good day, and it only gets better. Both levels bid you welcome to pre-sales for ghoulish official How to Beat merchandise and support the evil scientists behind the How to Beat videos. It only gets better subscribers are invited to the X-rated party. Ad-free and uncensored videos too repulsive for all audiences are available on demand. How to Beat Patreon. In space, no one can hear you scream, but on Patreon, everyone can see you bleed. How to Beat Patreon. Join us if you dare. She searches around the derelict hallways for the officer that she's supposed to be meeting, only to find him shouting curses and aggressively kicking a basketball around. He explains that the people she ran into on her way over were members of the cult who managed to avoid doing time in prison, and tonight they're tearing the town apart as a way to take revenge for their fallen leader. With introductions out of the way, the officer shows Jessica to her post, leaving his personal cell number on the board just in case, but warning her only only to call if there's a serious emergency. After noticing her last name, he trashes her father and gives her one final bit of advice, stay out of the holding area. With that, he turns and walks out, leaving her alone to survive the night. Okay, talk about a tough first night on the job. Jessica here might be determined to find out what drove her father crazy, but you couldn't pay me enough to spend 15 minutes alone in that creepy ass station. Forget about a whole graveyard shift. After watching the cult tearing up the town on her drive over, and seeing how that other officer couldn't wait to get out of there, it's obviously only a matter of time before this turns into a fight for survival. His instructions may have been short, but they definitely were clear. And if there's one thing you can bet on, it's that the holding area is bad news. We might not know exactly why just yet, but after taking one look around the station, do you really need to ask? There's something inhuman lurking within those walls, and if you're planning on making it to sunrise with your sanity still intact, then it's time to get prepared for when things start going bump in the night. The first and most important thing to do is establish a controlled area to work with. Since the only task she's really responsible for is to answer the phone if somebody calls, this means that we 
can narrow our travel down to just the office and the hallway that leads to the front door, I'd start by getting familiar with my path to the exit, clearing any rooms along the way, and doing what I could to seal them off if I felt like it was necessary. That way I'd have a safe route from the desk back to my squad car in the parking lot when and if things started to pop off. Holding is off limits, and that's perfectly fine by me, because she's not supposed to be arresting any perps tonight anyway. There's no reason to set one foot into that part of the station, so I'd see if I could lock or barricade the back door of the office from my side. That way, nothing that can't pass through walls could sneak up on me, and I wouldn't be tempted to go investigate any mysterious sounds trying to lure me in. The map on the wall near the elevator should show me alternate exits to make a quick escape if things get crazy and I'm cut off from the front door. So for now, there's no need to go exploring anywhere else. Just sit tight at the desk, keep your eyes on the security cameras, and get ready to shoot first and ask questions later if any of those cultist creeps try anything funny. If you don't go poking around anywhere you shouldn't, then making it through the night will be a breeze. But something tells me that Jessica here isn't going to stay out of trouble for long. As quickly as the other officer is gone, strange things start to happen. She hears unexplained noises coming from Holding, but decides to take his advice for now and doesn't investigate. As she's settling in at the desk, the elevator bell dings and it sounds like it's moving, but nobody gets off. Now that she has the station all to herself, Jessica goes for a stroll and finds her dad's old locker, noticing that it's the only one that's still locked up. Behind her, she hears what sounds like someone's bare feet running on a wet floor, but when she goes to check it out, she's immediately distracted by another strange noise, the sound of the basketball bouncing somewhere in the hall. She walks to the gym to investigate, thinking that it must be the other officer, but the ball is sitting in the middle of the room with no one in sight, and when she looks up, she sees the shadow of her father watching her from the other side of the hall. Frightened, she flips on the lights and the man disappears, just as a buzzer sounds through the Intercom. Someone's at the front door. Back in the lobby, she finds a disheveled looking man yelling bizarre questions at her, asking things like, where's my baby? And why did you leave? She asks the creep if he needs any help, but he looks her dead in the eye and pees all over the floor before turning and walking away. After cleaning up the mess with a mop, Jessica finds a pair of bolt cutters in the janitor's closet and decides to double back to the showers to take another shot at her dad's locker. She clamps down on the padlock, but no luck, she still can't get in. Determined to get through, she grabs a fire extinguisher from the wall and bashes it as hard as she can, but the padlock still holds. The phone rings back in the office and she jogs to pick it up, hearing the sounds of a pig squealing and some creepy lady taunting her on the other end. She hangs up and the phone immediately rings again. After realizing that it's the same people, she decides to contact the new police station across town to see if they can trace the call, but the officer tells her that they're too busy and abruptly hangs up on her. Frustrated, she storms back into the locker room and draws her pistol, firing a single shot and finally breaking the padlock. Inside, she finds an old picture of her and her father together before realizing that the locker has a false bottom and pulling it up, discovering a strange black box buried within the foundation. She rummages through it, uncovering a single shoe belonging to the woman who was just murdered by the cult, and a folder full of files and grisly pictures relating to the case. Just then, she hears squealing from somewhere nearby and notices on the security cameras that someone chained up a massive pig just outside the front doors. Unsure what to do, she calls the other station for advice, and they recommend that she stays inside since the cult is running wild all over town. The department is stretched too thin, and if anything were to happen to her, they wouldn't be able to send any backup her way. As if she didn't hear a word of what the guy just said, she decides to open the door, noticing that the pig's back is marked in blood with the cult's symbol. It's also wearing a collar with a name tag, Betty, the same as the girl who was murdered. Forgetting that this is a police station and not a petting zoo, she takes the pig inside and locks it in a storage closet. No sooner does she shut it in than she hears the sounds of furniture being pulled around in one of the dark abandoned hallways. While she was distracted, someone got inside. Okay. Things keep going from bad to worse for our rookie cop. With everything that's been going on, opening the doors to bring that pig inside should have been totally out of the question. 
especially after receiving all of those prank calls from the cult and noticing that it was named after one of the girls they killed. If their pet is showing up on your doorstep, then the creeps who own it must be nearby. And the smartest thing to do would have been to leave it out there until the morning, just like the other officers said, instead of taking the obvious bait. Things were already looking bad enough to the point that I'd strongly consider saying screw it and just going out to the parking lot to spend the rest of the night scrolling TikTok from the safety of my squad car. Unexplained noises, elevators turning on by themselves, and hallucinations of your dead dad practicing his layups can only mean one thing. This station is home to an inhuman spirit, most likely a demon. To make matters worse, now someone, or something, is moving furniture around one of the abandoned parts of the building. And that's all I'd need to hear before packing it in for the night. Even with a Glock, there's no chance in hell that I'm going to investigate the source of those sounds without backup. I am officially out of there, and if the other station wants to send someone to see why I'm not picking up the phone anymore, they'll find me out in the parking lot locked inside my cruiser waiting out the night where I know that it's safe. Even though she got what she came for from her father's locker, Jessica doesn't seem to know when to admit that she's over her head, and the real nightmare is about to begin. Drawing her pistol and flashlight, she searches the area until she finds one of the back doors propped open with a shovel. She closes and locks the door, but whoever it was is still somewhere in there. She runs down the hallway just as the figure disappears around a corner, chasing them back into the office, where she sees that it's the huge bearded man from before. With beads of sweat dripping down her forehead, she approaches him from behind, nervously ordering him to get on the ground. Instead, he slowly turns to face her, holding in his hands the bloody shoe of the girl who was killed. Deciding not to shoot, Jessica holsters her pistol and goes for for her taser. By the time that she looks back up, the man crosses the room shouting right in her face, and she drops him with a blast of 50,000 volts. The man lays on the ground, with Jessica ordering him to roll over and cuffing his hands behind his back before walking him into the mold-infested holding area and bringing him to a cell. She tries to force him in, but the man refuses to take another step resisting with everything in his power and screaming out in terror. Determined to get the man inside, she steps through the door and begins dragging him in by the shoulders. But that's when the heavy steel door swings shut, trapping her inside. Panicking, she pounds on the door, but it's locked tight. And when she tries to call for help over the radio, she only hears static on the other end. Suddenly, the man rushes past her towards the door, causing her to drop her flashlight. She tries to pick it up, but can't find it, only for to click on from the other side of the cell, shining directly in her face. Looking away, she orders the man to give it back as the light slowly glides across the room, showing that he's actually cowering in the corner. They're not the only ones in the cell. Jessica screams and goes for the door, but the flashlight rolls back over to her, and when she picks it up, three hanging bodies drop from the ceiling just a few feet away. She notices that the door is finally open and locks the man inside, stopping to catch her breath out in the hallway and trying her best to remain calm. Okay, I think by now it's safe to say that Jessica here isn't the best cop. It's only a few hours into her first shift, and she wouldn't even still be alive if it weren't for dumb luck. Jessica, you up. Let's start where it all went wrong, deciding to volunteer for a shift at the most haunted police station in America. When even the veteran officers who've seen it all can't wait to get out of there, you've got to know that this isn't the place to be confronting your daddy issues. If you're looking for closure, maybe try going to therapy. Now think about this, it's the middle of the night, you're alone with no backup on the way, and a giant crazy guy just broke in. Your response is to walk right up to him and politely ask him to leave? You have a gun. Keep your distance and use your cop voice. That way, you won't end up nearly getting body slammed by the creep. Remember way back an hour ago when the other police officer said that the one and only thing you needed to do was stay out of holding? Pretty straightforward, right? So now that you've got the 6'4", 230 pound homeless dude in custody, what do you decide to do? He hasn't really done anything that would make it necessary to detain him other than use the open back door to get into this abandoned hellhole of a station. Keeping this guy around just adds to the danger, and the smartest thing to do would have been to just take him out and tell him to beat it. At least you 
few managed to make it out alive, but not before the trio of cult ghosts decided to swing down for a quick hello. That was an insanely close call, and completely avoidable if you'd just taken the advice you were given and stayed the hell out of there, when you've only narrowly managed to avoid death several times before your shift is even halfway over. Jessica, you f***ed up. After heading back to her desk, she decides to call the original officer's personal phone for some advice, doing what she can to sound professional even though she's clearly starting to lose it. She asks him if he's seen things that weren't really there, and he immediately knows that she went into the holding area, warning her that that place is full of black mold that can cause hallucinations. Annoyed that she called so late at night, he tells her to shut up and do her job before hanging up the phone. Jessica picks up some of the old files that the homeless man was throwing around when she caught him, and realizes that they're full of disturbing drawings all bearing the cult's mark. The Totem of Temple Baron, a pre-biblical demonic entity that psychos worship. Under the box, she finds a mysterious thumb drive and decides to check it out. As she goes out to get her laptop from her squad car, someone drives by and throws a beat-up looking lady into the street before speeding away. She brings the woman back to the office to give her some first aid, but while they're talking, she zones out, staring at something out of sight behind her. Snapping out of it, the woman explains something terrifying. Although the media reported that the cultists were killed by the officers during the raid last year, the truth is that she was there that night and saw them brought into the station where they eventually all hung themselves. Before she can finish, the woman starts to freak out again, staring at something over Jessica's shoulder and promising an unseen person that she won't say anything more before shouting out some sort of disturbing incantation. Deciding that she's had enough, Jessica orders her out of the station and the woman leaves. Okay, we've just learned a lot of important information. When the other officer hears that Jessica's been seeing things, he immediately blames it on the black mold infesting the holding area. This seems like a neat and tidy logical explanation, but I wouldn't be so sure just yet. While experts do say that the toxic spores created by black mold can cause hallucinations, it's considered to be a very rare symptom, and for most people you'd have to be predisposed to mold allergies to feel any of these severe effects. Before the visions set in, Jessica would have shown shown several other warning signs, such as eye and throat irritation, a persistent cough, and a runny nose. It's true that the mold could have been the culprit, but Jessica seems to be in otherwise perfect health, indicating that the real cause could be something much more sinister. When it comes to other possible explanations, we don't have to look very far since we've just found out that the demon-worshipping cultists took their own lives in the same cell that she was just trapped inside of. One of the hallmarks of demonic possession is seeing things that aren't really there, and these visions could mean that Jessica is quickly falling victim to whatever evil spirit is lurking with in the halls. The best bet, no matter which explanation you believe, would be to just get out of there while she still has the chance. But Jessica is either too brave or too stupid to know when to quit. Letting that strange woman into the station was a huge mistake. We know that the cult is running wild all over town, and someone just so happens to dump this lady on the sidewalk at that exact moment that Jessica went out to grab her laptop? That's way too much of a coincidence for me. Instead of letting her in, I would have made her wait outside while I went to get some band-aids and a water bottle, and then given her directions to the nearest hospital and told her, good luck. Not only does Jessica let her inside, but after she finally kicks her out for shouting demonic gibberish, she decides to just let her find her own way to the front door. What was she thinking? Who knows if she'll even leave at all, or what kind of mischief she might get into on her way out. For all Jessica knows, that lady is about to let her cult friends right through the front door and then it's human sacrifice time. Well, I'm not going out that easy. After what happened with the big guy, I'm not taking any more chances, and if these cultists think they can get one over on me so easily, then they've got another thing coming. As soon as she's gone, the phone rings again, but this call is different. The woman on the other end says that she's taken one of the survivors from the last raid hostage, a girl named Monica, and if she ever hangs up the phone again, 
they'll kill her. Jessica asks the woman what she wants, but she says that she's only doing the bidding of their leader, the cult's founder, John Malum. Although he's supposed to be dead, the woman says that he's just taken another form and tells her that tonight they plan to finish what they started with her father. Jessica calls the other station for help and the other officer tells her that what she heard could definitely be true. Monica went missing from a party that very night along with the other two survivors, Julie and Anna. He promises to reach out to the phone company and trace the call before hanging up and leaving her alone once again. Finally getting back to the USB drive, Jessica plugs it into the computer and finds that it's full of video files from the night of the raid. She watches as the creepy lady from the phone tells Betty that she's going to be sacrificed to feed the demon before brutally killing her with a bat while the others look on. Disturbed, Jessica closes the file and steps away from her desk, answering a call from her mom while the laptop starts to play more of the videos on its own just out of sight. Her mom can hear the women singing in the background and yells at Jessica to turn off the laptop, but no matter what she tries, she can't get it to stop. The cultists face the camera and shout her name, and suddenly the video cuts to a shot of her sitting at her desk from right behind her back. She whips around in her seat, but there's no one there. While on the screen, she watches herself get up and slam the evidence box to the floor. Looking over from behind the computer, she sees the box there on the ground next to a paper target with the words, still here, written on it in blood. Deciding to investigate, she goes to the gun range and shines her flashlight around in the darkness, but it looks like nobody's there. In the shadows, at the very end of the room, she finds a photo of her father taped to a mannequin, and while her back is turned, the targets start to move across the range, the last one coming straight towards her. She sees that this target has the mark of the cult painted on its head, and when she reaches to pull it down, a demonic pale-faced man is standing right on the other side dressed in the same clothes as the cult's leader. She screams and runs for her life, the monster lunging for her as she stumbles up the stairs, but manages to get away just in time. Okay, that's one creepy looking culprit. I'd hate to have that guy roaming around my basement, but the good news is, at least now we know what we're up against. Those razor sharp fangs are terrifying, but Jessica here has one advantage that most victims could only wish for, a fully loaded Glock. Right now, we don't know if it can be even injured, but there's only one way to find out. Empty the clip and see if it bleeds. Since it didn't outright kill her when it had the opportunity, chances are that this thing wants her alive for some reason. It's a terrifying thought, but that also means that it isn't willing to hurt you until its evil plan is complete. So if you can't kill it, getting the hell out of there is your next best option. Seriously, at any point in the night, Jessica could have just made the smartest move of all and walked away. I would have been out of there hours ago, but as we're about to see, soon escape isn't going to be an option. Jessica rushes for the front door, realizing that it's been chained shut from the outside. Panicking, she runs from exit to exit, but they're all chained shut in the same way. She circles back to the desk and calls the other stations and begging the other officer for help. He tells her to stay strong and promising that he'll send over some officers to get her before hanging up to answer another call. The phone rings again and this time it's the cult singing on the other end. Her radio starts to play static and the elevator dings, groaning to life. She takes out her pistol, waiting to blast whoever gets off, but the door never opens and the basketball slams into it from behind her, thrown across the room by some unseen force. With all of this going on, her laptop starts to play footage of the cult members being escorted into the station and interrogated by her father. What they say is mostly just insane ramblings, but the important takeaway is that they worship some being called the Low God, and John believes himself to be its vessel on Earth. Her father stands up and leaves the room, checking the hallway as if he saw something outside. Rewinding the tape and looking closer, Jessica notices a massive demon with an inverted pentagram-shaped face, the Temple Baron appearing for the first time. Suddenly, someone throws a sheet over her head, and she's wheeled through the halls on a gurney, paralyzed with fear. The man takes her into the department morgue, along with the bodies of John and two women from the cult. Instead of trying to break out or fight back, she only lays there crying. 
the bodies convulse, as if coming back to life just as a group of cultists breaks in, wheeling some of the bodies away. Finally able to move, she unzips the bag and sits up, screaming in horror as one of the bodies also sits straight up. Terrified, Jessica falls to the ground, picking herself up and realizing that she's now back in the office. She hears someone call out to her from the hallway and approaches with her pistol leveled, but it's only two officers there to retrieve the homeless man in the cell. The officers introduce themselves and she hands them the cell keys, one of the men reluctantly going to get the prisoner out of holding. The other officer tells Jessica that he has something to show her and she follows him to a storage closet to see what it is. He reaches down behind a filing cabinet and pulls out something disturbing, the very same shotgun that her father used to massacre everyone at the station before turning it on himself. Warning her not to touch it, he bends down to put it back, and when he stands back up, his head is suddenly a gory mess. Jessica spins around to run, turning straight into her father who raises the shotgun and fires. But when she takes her arms down, she sees that now she's somehow in the cult's barn. John stands in front of a group of his followers, holding a baby that he baptizes in his own blood as an offering to the demon. As he hands it over to a woman standing by his side, she realizes with horror that it's a younger version of her mother and the baby is actually herself. Jessica wakes up back at her desk, the homeless man screaming from his cell with one of the dead officers holding him at gunpoint from inside. She opens the door and the man immediately books it down the hall, the officer nowhere in sight. The prisoner comes to the room where she put the pig and thinks that she hears his daughter crying for help from inside, opening the lock and stepping through the door. The pig pushes its way out with blood covering its mouth. Meanwhile, Jessica calls her mom and leaves her a voice she sits back at the laptop and plays the rest of the video, watching as her mom explains that her police officer father will come to get them soon, but it's all a part of John's evil plan. Her mother reaches out and touches the camera, and suddenly the murdered girl jumps up from the side of the desk. Jessica screams and scrambles away, the monster crawling after her and chasing her into the next room. She gets to her feet and runs further into the abandoned part of the station, watching as the creature searches for her in the darkness. Terrified, she takes out her pistol but accidentally knocks over a floodlight. The monster bursts from the shadows behind her and she spins around, dropping it with a single shot and realizing that it was actually the pig all along. The doorbell rings again. This time, it's her mom and Jessica lets her in, noticing that the chain is now lying on the ground outside. She confronts her mother for being a part of the cult. Before she can fully explain herself, the woman sees a vision of her father luring her deeper into the station. As they come to the office, she hears a scream from somewhere in the halls and tells her mom to stay put while she goes to find out who else is in there. She enters the gym and finds the one-eyed lady holding one of the girls at gunpoint. It's a tense standoff, but Jessica gives in and puts away her weapon, asking the woman what she wants. The cultist explains that her time has come and she needs the power from spilling human blood to complete the ritual, cocking her revolver and executing the girl right in front of her. Jessica raises her pistol, hitting the woman and killing her. Suddenly, a massive gang of cultists rushes at her from the shadows, and she runs for her life, locking the gym doors closed with her handcuffs. Okay just got real. Jessica here got one back for that poor victim and opened up a new eye hole in the Cyclops with the cowboy revolver, but she missed out on a very important detail. Just before she took the shot, the psycho explained to Jessica that she herself is the most important part of the cult's ritual and needs to spill human blood to make it work. Now, as tempted as I would be to go back to the storage room, grab that shotgun and start John wicking my way through these freaks like they deserve, the reality is that this is exactly what the cult wants me to do do, so I need to come up with another plan. Escape is always an option, especially now that the chains are back off the front door, but the problem is that the cult is only going to keep coming after her even if she manages to get away. She can't kill them one at a time, since that runs the risk of her accidentally giving the demon power and fulfilling the dark ritual. So if she's going to put an end to this once and for all, she needs to take them out all at once. What better way to do that than to burn the whole station to the ground with them still inside? This station is full of flammable junk, so with her taser and some chemicals from the janitor's closet, she could easily turn this place into an inferno, using the chains to reseal the exits and picking off any cultists that somehow managed to escape. 
There's really nothing stopping her from just lighting the place up, except for the fact that her mom and the two other hostages are still probably somewhere in the building, but let's think about that for a moment. Her mom is a deranged cultist who willingly gave her up as a baby to be a future sacrifice to a demonic creature from the depths of hell. If you're asking me, I wouldn't be putting my life on the line to save her, and the same goes for the other two girls that the cult has hostage. Her dad already saved them once, and if you manage to get caught by the same cult twice in the span of a year, that's on you to figure out. You can't just live your life getting abducted by demon worshippers and waiting for someone else to come by and save the day. Sometimes, you've gotta be able to save yourself, which is exactly what I'd be doing as I watched the place burn from the safety of my car. She hurries back to the office, her mom nowhere to be found. The phone rings, and at first it sounds like the other station calling to check on her. But in reality, the line was never connected, and the voice quickly changes to John's, telling her that tonight the Low God will finally come. Something stumbles through the darkness in the hallway behind her, and she realizes that it's the homeless man, his foot completely devoured by the pig, leaving only a stump of bloody bone. He lets out a demonic roar and charges her, but Jessica fires several shots into his chest. The cult manages to break through the gym doors, and she cowers behind her desk, trying to call for backup with no success. Just then, she hears her mother scream for help from somewhere in the building and gathers her courage for one last fight. Searching through the hallway, she hears someone banging on the stairwell door when suddenly, another cultist jumps at her from behind and she drops them with two shots. As she rounds the corner, she finds one of the innocent girls hanging from the ceiling, the mark of the cult on the floor below her feet. The two dead cops come to taunt her, daring her to come in but she ignores them, running down the hall towards the sounds of someone else screaming. She finds one of the cultists attacking another hostage with a knife and fires. The man reaches over and slits the girl's throat, and Jessica shoots him in the head. She runs to put pressure on the girl's wound, trying her hardest to stop the bleeding, but the girl dies there on the floor. Looking up, Jessica sees her father walk by at the end of the hall and goes to the locker room to confront him. She asks him why he hurt those people, and in a demonic voice, he simply responds that he had to. Suddenly, one of the cultists fires at her and she shoots back but misses, her father disappearing once again. Back out in the hall, another creep rushes across and she fires. She makes her way into the holding area where the mold has almost completely taken over, killing two more of the psychos and finding the last hostage still alive hanging in a cell. Jessica tries to cut the woman down, but something tightens the rope amputating three of her fingers before completely decapitating the girl, covering her face in blood. Defeated, she looks up and sees something there on the ceiling, emptying her gun at the unseen creature with no effect. She needs another weapon, so she goes to the storage locker to grab her father's shotgun, ready to finish this off once and for all. Following the sounds down into the basement, she finds two of the dead cultists there taunting her from the gun range. But instead of attacking, they only point her into the next room. Turning the corner, she sees that the cult has built another demonic throne, and it looks like her mother is sitting in it surrounded by candles with a bag over her head. Jessica creeps forward, carefully removing the bag, but instead of her mother, a zombified John snarls back at her from underneath. She tries to run, only to be cornered in by the rest of the cult, and they slowly part to reveal something huge with glowing eyes looming in the shadows. The cult chance as the Temple Baron walks towards her, unaffected by the blasts from her shotgun. Standing over her, it roars as its face detaches from its body and onto Jessica's head. The next thing that she knows, she's back upstairs in the hallway with the demonic cult leader standing right in front of her. She fires into its chest, dropping it to its knees, but just as she's about to deliver the kill shot, she sees that it wasn't John after all. It was her mother. Okay, that's tough. Her mom was a horrible person through and through, so I can't say I'm sad to see her go, but I have a bad feeling about how this is going to end for our rookie cop. She may have not realized it until it was too late, but if she'd been paying attention to the events throughout the night, there was actually a way she could have known this was a trick before she took the shot. They haven't all been deadly, but Jessica knows that she's been experiencing extremely vivid hallucinations from the moment that the other cop left her alone in the station. From the visions of her father, to the cultists hanging in the cell, the ghoul in the basement, 
basement, and the phantom cops who showed up halfway through the night. It's clear that the demon has been messing with her head, and she can't trust anything that she thinks she sees. The biggest hint of all was her encounter with that crawling zombie with the gory face back in the office. It may have looked real after all, but after she shot it dead, she realized that it was just the huge pig all along. The demon has been making her see things to drive her to violence, which it needed to do for its ritual to be complete. If she was thinking clearly, she could have remembered this and resisted the urge to blow the cult leader away, possibly saving her mother's life. It looks like that was Jessica's last chance to escape, but she made the wrong call, and now she has nowhere to run. The woman falls to the floor dead, and Jessica screams with terror as she realizes what she's just done. Behind her, the rest of the cult appears from the shadows, clapping and celebrating. The demon whispers in her ear, and she cackles before raising her pistol to her own head and pulling the trigger. Two of the psychos drag her away, and seating her next to Malum in her own throne. The dark ritual is finally complete. But what would you do if you were stationed at a scary police station all night? Would you pull a Leon Kennedy from Resident Evil 2 and speed run through the evening to get that S rank? Or would you sit there like a scared little kid and let the demonic forces of the evil night take you alive? Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and comment down below on how you would survive the spooky police station at night. Remember, we upload on Wednesdays and Saturdays, so we'll see you again during the week. Until next time, have a damn good day.